Hello and welcome to this second follow along video for leap training exercise number two. My name is Charlie Heaps, I'm the developer of Leap. And in this video, my colleague Chris Malley from SEI York is going to take you through training exercise number two. This exercise it builds on the first training exercise, which is covered in another video, and it covers the industry, transport and commercial sectors. You can get a PDF copy of the exercises here at leap.sei.org slash training. And in Leap, as a reminder, you can open the included Fredonia dataset, then use menu option area revert to version to see answer keys corresponding to the end of each section of the exercises. Over to you, Chris. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this tutorial for Leap Exercise 2. The purpose of this tutorial is to provide a step-by-step -step guide for the second LEAP exercise, which focuses on the energy demand sector. Exercise 2 builds on what was done in exercise 1, so if you haven't done exercise 1 yet, we recommend that you go and do that first. In this exercise, we'll be covering three other energy demand sectors, industry, transport, commercial and buildings, um, and we'll be using the information in the exercise to build up and to show the different options for looking at energy demand that there are available in LEAP. So we're going to start from where we left off in exercise one. And in section 2.1 of the exercise two, we are told that there are two principal energy intensive industries in Fredonia, iron and steel and pulp and paper. All other industries can be grouped into a single category. We're given the um, industrial output for each of the industries. We're told that the, the 600,000 tonnes of iron and steel, 400,000 tonnes of production from pulp and paper, and then the value added of the other industry sector, 1.8 billion US dollars. We're then also told that energy use in iron and steel and pulp and paper industries can be divided into two end uses, process heat and motive power. So let's start to build our tree stu structure for our industry sector. I'm going to first add a branch called industry. And here I don't want to enter any data. So I'm just going to select the units here of no data. I'm then going to add my first subsector, iron and steel. And here, the activity variable is production in units of metric tons. So I'm going to select current accounts here and enter in the production in 2010, 600,000 metric tons. I then have two um, energy uses, process heat and motive power. So I'm going to create two subcategories for those. And motive power. And I'm told that in the process heat, all of it is uh, generated using coal. So I'm going to select a technology with energy intensity and I'm going to select bituminous coal as my fuel. For motive power, I'm going to use electricity because I'm told that electricity is the only fuel used for motive power. So now I've created my branch structure for iron and steel. I've entered the production. The process heat and motive power both are needed. So I'm selecting percent saturation here because both are used in the production. It's not an either or. So we want percent saturation. Then for motive heat, I'm told that there is 24 gigajoules of coal used per tonne. And for motive power, there is 2.5 gigajoules of electricity used. I then want to do the same thing for pulp and paper. So I'm going to first add a category for pulp and paper. And then I'm going to create my process heat and my motive 
power. I'm told that wood-fired boilers meet all the process heat requirements. So my technology with energy intensity here, the feedstock fuel is wood, and I'm going to call it wood fired boilers, and for motive power, it's electricity. So the pulp and paper sector, the, the units of production are the same, but our production is 400,000 tonnes um, in this case. Then going to change to saturation the motive power and process heat. And I'm told that the process heat requirements are 40 gigajoules per tonne of production. And for motive power, it is three megawatt hours. So I'm going to change my units here to megawatt hours and put in three. For other industries, I'm not told the energy intensity of individual processes or individual fuels. I'm told the total energy consumption by other industries. 36 million gigajoules of energy in 2010. I'm then told how that fuel is shared. 40% of the energy is electricity and the remainder is residual fuel shares. So in this case, we want to use a slightly different approach for our other industry sector. We're going to create a category with an energy intensity. We're going to call it other industries. The production in this case is not in tons, it's in currency units, US dollars. And the production is 1.8 billion US dollars. What I'm then asked here is to provide the total, the, the, the uh, total final energy intensity for the whole category. And it wants it in units of gigajoules per US dollar, because US dollar is my activity level. So I have, I can calculate my energy intensity by taking 36 million and dividing it by 1.8 billion. That gives me my final energy intensity for other industrial production. This is the number of gigajoules per US dollar. That's then consumed as electricity and residual fuel oil. So I want to add in here electricity as one of my um, sources of energy and residual fuel oil as the other. So now I have electricity and I have residual fuel oil and I have a branch here called fuel share where I can say 40% of the energy is electricity and the remainder is residual fuel oil. So that is the data for current accounts. Now in section 2.1.2 we want to Enter the how things are going to change in the baseline scenario. For iron and steel, our total output is not expected to change. But natural gas is going to provide for 10% of the process heat requirements in 2040. And natural gas boilers are 10% more efficient than coal boilers. So if I go to iron and steel and process heat, I just have coal there for the moment. I'm going to add a new branch with natural, natural gas as the fuel. In current accounts, the percent share of using natural gas is zero, but I can enter the energy intensity, and it's 10% of the coal boilers. So I could enter that as 24 times 0 0.9, it's 10% lower. I could also refer to the branch, the coal final energy intensity is, is equivalent. Then in my baseline scenario, I'm going to say that 
10% of the process heat requirements are going to be met by natural gas in 2040. We can create that expression in different ways. I'm going to set remainder 100 to natural gas. And I'm going to say that by 2040, coal is going to meet 90% of the requirements. And that automatically gives us 10% consumed as natural gas. In the baseline scenario for pulp and paper, we're told that there are two new plants expected that will add 100,000 tonnes of production capacity per year after they, have been, um, after they have been established. To enter this, we're going to use this step function. We're going to say in 2015, we will have 500,000 tonnes of capacity. And in 2020, we will have 600,000 tonnes of capacity. So we have this immediate increase in our capacity in 2015 and 2020 to model those two new plants coming online. We're then told our output from other industries is expected to grow at a rate of 3.5% per year. So our activity level, our output in other industries is going to grow at 3.5% per year. And the fuel share of electricity is expected to rise to 55% by 2040. So we're changing our fuel share to increase the share of electricity. We've now entered all the data that we need to for the current accounts and the baseline scenario for our industrial sector. So turning to section 2.1.3, we can view the results to see whether our industrial energy demand matches what is included here. So here we're looking at the fuels, we're looking at the branches, and we're looking at the energy consumption in 2010 and in 2040. So let's click on results and see if we get something similar. So at the moment, I, um, I want to change from chart view to my table view. And then I want to be looking at my baseline scenario. And indeed, I see that my um, energy consumption has gone from 72.2 to 147.3. So I have the um, I have the um, I, I, I have the correct increase in electricity consumption in energy consumption. Sorry, um, between 2010 and 2040 in my industrial sector. So let's move now to section 2.2, where we're going to model the um, the transport sector, the energy demand from transport. I'm going to go back to analysis. I've got households, I've got industry. And we're given information about passenger transport. We're told all passenger transport in Fredonia is by road, cars and buses or rail. So we're going to ignore air and water transport for this exercise. We're given information that says in 2010, cars were estimated to have traveled about 8 billion kilometers, buses about 1 billion kilometers. Surveys have been done that tell us the average number of occupants, the load factor, 2.5 for cars and 40 for passengers. We also have the fuel economy, 12 kilometers per liter of gasoline for cars, three kilometers per liter of, uh, of diesel for buses. 50, and we have 15 billion passenger kilometers in 2010. In the exercise, we then have a sheet here that allows us to calculate the number of passenger kilometers for each of our transport modes to then enter it into a leap. So I have a version of this in Excel, which we can use for um, calculating our total passenger kilometers. 
that we can then split between different types of fuels. So for cars, they travel 8 billion vehicle kilometers per year, and they have on average 2.5 uh, people per vehicle kilometer. So that gives us total car passenger kilometers of 20 billion passenger kilometers. For buses, they travel a billion vehicle kilometers, but they have an average of 40 people on them. So that gives us a total bus passenger kilometers of 40 billion passenger kilometers. We then have 15 billion rail kilometers. So that gives us a total passenger kilometer of 75 billion passenger kilometers. We then have uh, told the car fuel economy, 12 kilometers per liter. And our load factor is the same, 2.5. So that gives us an energy intensity of 0 0.03 liters per passenger kilometer. For buses, it was three kilometers per liter, but 40 passengers per vehicle kilometer. So that gives us an energy intensity of 0 0.0083 liters per passenger kilometer. So this is all the information we need to enter into LEAP. So let's now create our, um, let's now create our transport structure. So I'm going to right click and click add and I'm going to add transport. And I'm then going to add the subcategory of passenger. And for transport, I'm not going to I'm not going to have any data at the level of transport. No, no data needed there. I'm going to go back to current accounts and the units for passengers is going to be transport units and passenger kilometers. And my total passenger kilometers, if I go back to Excel, was 75 billion passenger kilometers. 75 billion passenger kilometers. That was split between road and rail. So I've got road and I've got rail. So now it's asking me what percentage of my passenger kilometers are road, what percentage are rail. So that can be calculated here. 15 billion passenger kilometers were rail, 60 billion passenger kilometers were um, road. So the percent share of passenger kilometers that were road is 60 divided by 75 times 100. And rail is remainder 100. So 80% of our passenger kilometers were road, 20% were rail. Our road passenger kilometers were then split further by car and by bus. Buses accounted for 40 billion passenger kilometers, cars for 20 billion. So the percent share of passenger kilometers that were taken by car is 20 divided by 60 times 100. And the rest were bus. So two thirds bus, one third car. We now want to enter the type of fuel used for uh, car travel. In this case, we're assuming that all of the uh, fuel used for cars was gasoline and all of the fuel used for buses is diesel. And we can enter our energy intensity. In this case, our units for both diesel, for both cars and buses is litre per passenger kilometre.
So let's change the units to litre per passenger kilometre. And let's look at our values. 0 0.03 for um, cars, 0 0.0083 for um, buses. So for car, 0 0.0333. For buses, 0.008333. We're also given some information about um, our um, rail sector. 20% of the um, rail transport is by electric trains, the remainder by diesel trains. So we can now add our two fuels that are used for um, that are used for um, rail. We can add electricity and we can add diesel. So 20% of our journeys are by electric trains, the remainder by diesel. The energy intensity of electric trains is 0 0.1 kilowatt hours per passenger kilometer. And for diesel, it's 25% higher than electric trains. So we can do, we can say 0 0.1 times 1.25. But I need to change the units. That's why there's such a big difference on this graph. I need to change that to kilowatt hours. But I don't want to convert the expression. So we've got electricity and we've got diesel that is just 25% higher. We now have freight transport as well. So we don't just have passenger transport, we have freight transport. We're told that an average of 250 tonnes kilometres of freight is transported per capita per person. 85% of the, the freight is transported by road, the rest by rail. Road transport uses an average of four megajoules of diesel fuel per tonnes kilometer. Diesel freight trains have an average, have an energy intensity of three megajoules per tonnes kilometer. So let's first create our branch structure. So we have freight under transport now. And our, um, our units here are not tons kilometer, are not passenger kilometer, but ton kilometer when we're talking about freight. We again have road and we have rail. And we just have it broken down by fuel. So our road transport uses diesel. So we've got diesel as the fuel because it's heavy duty trucks that are being used. And for diesel, uh, for freight, rail is just transported on diesel freight trains. OK. So now we have to calculate the total number of passenger kilometers. So we're told that the average, uh, an average of 250 tons kilometers of freight is transported per capita. So we need to know the population to be able to enter this data. So I'm going to create a new branch under key assumptions, key variables that we want to use. And I'm going to click add. And I'm going to enter population and the units are people. So now I have a space where I can enter the population. And if I go back to exercise one, I can remember that there were 8 million people in Fredonia in 2010. And that the population was going to grow at a rate of 3% per year. So now that I have my population, I can use that variable to calculate my 
total freight kilometers. So I'm going to go to freight and I'm going to go to builder. I want 250 tons kilometer per person. To calculate the total, I want to multiply it by the number of people. So I want to refer to my key assumptions branch. And I can do that by typing the expression key to refer to key assumptions. And then I'm prompted to select what value I want. I want to change the units here so that it's 250 tons per person. And I need to change the scale here to, to zero. So this gives us 2 billion tons kilometers per person. And that makes sense because 250 times 8 million people will give us 2 billion tons kilometers. So we've got our total tons kilometers and we know that 85% of it is by road and the remainder is by rail. And we know that our road transport consumes 4 megajoules. So let's change this from gigajoules to megajoules. 4 megajoules of diesel per ton kilometer. And for diesel freight trains, it's 3 megajoules per tons kilometer. OK, now I've entered all of the information I need in the current accounts for the transport sector. In section 2.2.2, we're given the baseline scenario for passenger and freight transport. And we're told that the unit demand for passenger travel is expected to rise slightly faster than average income levels. The elasticity of demand for travel with respect to income is 1.1. So our population is growing at 2.5% per year. An average income per capita is expected to grow from its current level, $3,000 per person, at a rate of 3.5%. Cars are expected to account for 75% of passenger road traffic by 2040. So we've got a few changes that we need to make here to be able to represent that scenario for passenger travel. The first is we have our population variable under key assumptions. But my baseline assumption was wrong. It's growing at 2.5% per year, the population. We now need to add a second key assumption for average income. And this is dollar per person. And at current levels, it is $3,000 per person. And it's going to grow at a rate of 3.5% growth. 3.5%. The demand for passenger travel is going to rise slightly faster than income levels with an elasticity of 1.1%. So we want to use this average income for our passenger kilometers. We want them to grow at the, say, the, uh, the rate of average income increases, but slightly faster with an, uh, with an elasticity of 1.1%. So we can represent that using an expression growth as. And then we can find our variable average income. And then we can enter in our elasticity, 1.1%. So we're growing with average income, but slightly faster, 1.1%. And cars are expected to account for 75% of road passenger traffic by 2040. So we can now create an interp function that says 2040 is 75% cars. Reduction in bus use and increase in car use. For freight transport, the per capita demand for freight transport is expected to grow at a rate of 2% per year over the analysis period. So now for our baseline scenario for freight, we can click growth 
and we can enter 2% per year. The energy efficiency of all transport modes, both passenger and freight, is expected to improve by 0.5% per year for, uh, through to 2040, expect, except for cars, which are expected to improve by 1% per year. Okay, so let's start with cars. Our energy intensity is expected to improve by 1% per year. So we can use growth to do this, and we can enter a negative growth rate, minus 1% per year. For buses, they're going to improve at half a percent per year. I can copy this expression because it applies to all transport modes, including rail, and then paste it into these uh, other transport modes, rather than having to write it out every time. And that's, now I've created the transport sector. I can now go to section 2.2.3 and view the results. So in section 2.2.3, we now have the results looking at 2010 and 2040 in terms of the total energy demand for the transport sector. So let's click Save and click on Results. So I can go to Table. I'm still looking at the industry sector. If I click on, if I click on Transport, I can see that my energy demand in um, 2010 is correct for passenger cars, 41.1. But for freight, it's incorrect. It's 7.7 .7 million gigajoules. In the exercise, it's 38.5 million gigajoules. So let's look at the reason for that. Well, if I look down at road transport, it's incorrect 6.8 million gigajoules 0 0.9 million uh, gigajoules for diesel uh, uh, for road and for rail i can also notice that i've made a mistake under road transport in my projection it's meant to increase to 266.6 .6 million gigajoules in 2040 and this applies to both road and rail so let's look and analyze where I may have gone wrong. Let's start by looking at the freight sector in current accounts. So because both road and rail were incorrect for the freight sector. OK, so now let's move on to section 2.2 of the exercise and look at transport energy demand. In section 2.2.1, we look at the energy demand in current accounts for the transport sector. And we're given lots of information about the passenger transport sector. It's either by road or by rail, so we're going to ignore air or water transport here. And we know that cars were estimated to travel 8 billion kilometres, buses 1 billion kilometres. They have a load factor or an average occupancy of 2.5 people for cars, 40 people for, for buses. And we have information on energy intensities. We also have information on the, um, on the um, number of passenger kilometers taken by um, railroads. And in the exercise, We have a sheet that gives us uh, formulas and a way of calculating the total passenger kilometers for the transport sector. And I've translated that to Excel. So we have 8 billion um, vehicle kilometers taken by cars and 2.5 people per vehicle. 1 billion kilometers taken by uh, buses and 40 
passenger kilometers per vehicle kilometer. So this gives us a total car passenger kilometers of 20 billion, total bus passenger kilometer of 40 billion. My road passenger kilometers is equal to this one plus the car passenger kilometers. And my rail passenger kilometers, 15. The fuel economy of, car uh, of cars was 12 kilometers per litre and the load factor 2.5. For buses, 3 and 40. So this gives us all the information that we need to be able to um, um, uh, w w to be able to calculate the um, passenger kilometers and enter it into LEAP. So let's start now by building our structure. We have transport at the top. And we're advised we may wish to enter the total population as the um, activity level for the sector. And section 3.1 in exercise 1 gives us information about population. So what we want to have here is the total number of people as our activity variable. And we're told in 2010 that there are 40 million people in Fredonia. We then have our um, passenger transport. And it's saying what percentage share of um, of the, the units here are percent share of people, but we don't actually want that. We want to enter passenger kilometers. So we want to know how many passenger kilometers per person. The number of passenger kilometers per person is 75 billion passenger kilometers in total divided by 40. 75 divided by 40 passenger kilometers per person. So this is 75 billion passenger kilometers, sorry, divided by 40 million. So that gives us a thousand passenger kilometers per person. If we have 75 billion divided by 40 million, the resulting passenger kilometers per person is in units of thousand passenger kilometers per person. Then we have our different transport modes, road and rail. And for road, we have that split down by cars and by buses. And for cars, we use gasoline. We assume all, use, all cars use gasoline in Fredonia and all buses use diesel. And we're told in the exercise that rail uses electricity and uh, diesel, electric trains and diesel trains. So now that we've created the whole structure, and we've got our total passenger kilometers per person, we can now split that between road and rail. So the split between road and rail is our, if our total is 75, the fraction that is road is 60 divided by 75. So I can do 60, 75 times 100. And the remainder is rail. I then need to split my road passenger kilometers into cars and buses. And here I have, of my 60 billion passenger kilometers that are road, I have 20 billion cars, 40 billion buses. So I can do 20 divided by 60 times 100 to get my car passenger kilometers and the remainder buses. For rail, I'm told, told that 20% of rail transport is electric trains and the rest is diesel. So I've now split those passenger kilometers 
into... Um, I've now split the passenger kilometres into different fuels, into different modes. What I need to do now is enter the energy intensity for each mode. So for cars, my energy intensity is litres per passenger kilometre, and it's 0 0.033. So I'm first going to change my units to 0 0.033 liters per passenger kilometer and for buses it's 0 0.00833 for rail electric trains consume 0 0.1 kilowatt hours per passenger kilometer and diesel trains we're told uh, the energy intensity is 25% higher. Ah, I picked the wrong unit here. Instead of litres, it should have been kilowatt hours. Now we can see that we've got 25% higher for diesel. Okay. So now that I've got my passenger transport, I can turn my attention to my freight transport. So I'm going to create a new branch here for freight. And the units for freight are not passenger kilometres, they are tonnes kilometre. And we're told that there are 250 tonnes kilometre per person. So because we've got our population at the top level here, we can enter directly 250 ton kilometers per person. 85% of the freight is on road and the rest is by rail. Road transport uses diesel as does rail. We use diesel trains and diesel uh, trucks for um, transporting goods in Fredonia. So we're going to add in branches here for diesel. And my energy intensities are in units of megajoules per ton kilometer. So I'm going to select megajoules here. And we've got four megajoules per ton kilometer of diesel Three megajoule per ton kilometer of diesel for trains. So now I've entered everything I need for my current accounts for the transport sector. Section 2.2.2 .2 calculates or, or provides the information for the baseline scenario. And it tells us that the unit demand for passenger travel the number of passenger kilometres per person is expected to rise slightly faster than average income levels with an elasticity of 1.1. At the same time, the total population is going to grow at 2.5% per year. The average income level is expected to grow from its current level 3,000 at a rate of 3.5% per year in 2040. So the first thing I'm going to do here is to create a key assumption, a key variable called income. And this is in units of dollar per person. And in current accounts, this is 3,000. And in my baseline, it's going to grow at 3%, 3.5%, uh, sorry, per year. The next thing I'm going to do in my baseline is, is increase my population. It's going to grow at 2.5% per year. The unit demand for passenger travel is expected to rise faster than average income levels. So the number of passenger kilometers per person 
is going to grow as, so we can use the function growth as, and then specify this key assumption here using the branch path key backslash income, and then put in our elasticity. So our passenger kilometers are growing at 1.1 1 .1, uh, 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 with an elasticity of 1.1 1 .1 with respect to our average income. And in the future, cars are expected to account for 75% of passenger road traffic. So here I can use our inter function to say by 2040, cars will account for 75% of the road traffic. For freight transport, the per capita demand, the number of tons, kilometers per person, is expected to grow at a rate of 2% per year throughout the analysis. So my tons kilometer will be growth two percent per year over the course of the analysis. And we're also told the energy efficiency of all transport modes is expected to improve by 0.5% per year until 2040. Except for cars, they're expected to improve at 1% per year. So in this case, we want to change our energy intensity. And we want to apply a negative growth rate. For cars, our negative growth rate is 1%. But for buses, it's less minus 0.5 percent and we apply this to all others I can copy this branch and I can paste it for my other sectors so now I have entered all of the information for the transport sector and now I can view the results Section 2.2.3 shows us what the results are expected to be for our transport sector. 2010, 79.6 million gigajoules of energy consumed, increasing to 428.8 million gigajoules by 2040. So let's click save and go to our results and see if we get that value. So we see here 79.6 um, uh, million gigajoules in 2010 and 428 million uh, gigajoules in 2040, which shows us that we're getting um, the correct results for the transport um, sector. So let's move on now to the final part of exercise two, section 2.3, looking at the commercial sector. And this is an example of a useful energy analysis. In this, um, in this part of the exercise, we are going to look at space heating in commercial buildings. And, um, and it's an example of a useful energy analysis in LEAP. The useful energy analysis is helpful when multiple combinations of fuels and technologies can provide a common service, such as heating. And then when we have model device efficiencies. So if we look at section 2.3.1, we find that commercial buildings in Fredonia used a total of 100 million square meters of floor space in 2010. The total final energy consumption for heating was 20 million gigajoules in 2010. Residual fuel oil and electricity each currently supply half of the total heating energy. And natural gas will be in, introduced later. 
Electric heating has an efficiency of nearly 100%, while fuel oil boiler efficiencies average 65%. Natural gas boilers, 80%. So how do we implement this in LEAP? We're given a hint. So if we go back to analysis, we now want to create our commercial sector. We need to set up a, a category, which is our category with energy intensity branch. So let's add first our commercial sector. And then underneath that, we want to add a branch for heating that is a category with energy intensity we will want to check this useful energy analysis branch. So we're going to set up heating. And if we go back to 2010, we're then going to, um, uh, we're also, sorry, going to check final energy intensity in current accounts. In current accounts, we enter the final energy intensity, and then we use a useful energy analysis to look at how that changes into the future. So for our commercial sector, our activity variable are the number of square meters of floor space. 100 million square meters in 2010. And then we have a percent saturation of heating. All of that floor space has some sort of heating. And the final energy intensity was 20 million gigajoules in 2010. So we have 20 million gigajoules 20 million gigajoules divided by the total floor space to calculate our um, energy intensity to calculate our final energy intensity we want to take the total energy consumption 20 million gigajoules divided by the total activity 100 million square meters of floor space that gives us our final energy intensity, the number of gigajoules per square meter. We then have three different types of fuels that we want to add. We're going to add in electricity. We don't have any co-product at the moment. We're going to add in um, uh, res re uh, residual fuel oil. And we're going to add in natural gas. So we now have um, three different types of fuels. And we're given their efficiency. Electric boilers nearly 100%, residual fuel oil 65%, and natural gas boilers 80%. And we're also told residual fuel oil and electricity supply half of our um, energy consumption for heating at the moment. So now we've set up our commercial sector for heating for, um, for 2010. In section 2.3.2, we're given information for the baseline scenario. So let's switch over to our baseline scenario. So we're told that the um, we're told that the floor space in the commercial sector is going to grow at three percent per year. The second thing that we're told is that the due to the expected improvements in um, commercial building installation standards, the useful energy intensity, the amount of heat delivered per square meter is expected to decline by 1% per year until 2040. So if we go to our useful energy intensity, we can then enter an expression growth minus 1% per year. We're then told by 2040 natural gas boilers are expected to have reached the market penetration, i.e. the share of floor space, of 25% while fuel oil boilers are expected to decline to only 10% of market share. Electricity fills the remaining requirement. So in terms of the percent share of square meters, we will have 25% of, um, of the square meters heated using natural gas. So we can say interp 2040, 
25%. And residual fuel oil, interp 2040, 10%. And then we can type in remainder 100 to make up the difference with electricity. Finally, gradually improving energy efficiency standards for commercial boilers are expected to lead to improvements in the average efficiency of fuel oil and natural gas boilers. Fuel, fuel oil systems are expected to reach an efficiency of 75% by 2040 and natural gas systems 85%. So we then want to go to our efficiency branch here and say interp 2040 75%, interp 2040 85% for our natural gas boilers. So we've now created everything that we need to for the um, uh, for the energy demand sector in exercise two. If we go to section 2.3.3, we can then view the results. So section 2.3.3 allows us to view the results for commercial space heating demand and then 2.4 for the total energy demand. So let's check first that we've got the right information for commercial space heating demand. We've got it split by fuel and by year. 20 million gigajoules in 2010, increasing to 31.9. So let's click Save and then go and look at our results. Let's look in the commercial sector and table and select every 10 years. And we can see that we go from 20 million gigajoules to 31.9 million gigajoules. If we want to look at our total energy demand, we can click on the demand sector here that breaks it down. If I reduce the levels, I can see how that breaks down between households, industry, transport and commercial. And I'm going to change it to all years to see how that changes. And I can see that it rises to over 700 million gigajoules in the exercise in 2040. We can see that we get the same increase to over 700 million gigajoules. I can change it to a bar chart to get something similar to what is in the exercise. So we've now been able to get our total energy demand and that concludes exercise two. I hope you found this tutorial useful and good luck with your own LEAP analyses. That's all for today. Be sure to join the LEAP Facebook group for all the latest news and subscribe to the LEAP YouTube channel to see LEAP videos and be notified as new ones become available. You can get access to both of those from leap.sei.org. Thanks for watching.